vision come to fruition with the introduction of adult suffrage and the election of Ermie Bourne as the first female parliamentarian in 1951. I was two years old then. You could do the maths to find out how old I am, but somewhere along the line, a few years were taken off. But by the time I reached my student days, my love for what we called civics in those days endeared her and her achievements to me in a manner that in some ways fueled my desire to participate in active politics and later to contest a seat in the most forward-thinking parish in Barbados. It is still a mystery that it took 20 long years for her historic feat to be repeated or for there to be any semblance of a contest by any female candidate in any constituency in Barbados during this long sojourn. That does not take away from the significance of her being a trendsetter, a trailblazer, and a symbol of our acceptance, respect, and appreciation at last for the qualities of women in the workplace. Perhaps Dr. Springer will be able to unravel this puzzle. However, it is worthy to note, firstly, the fact that the first three women in Barbados that contested an election won their seat on their first attempt. Dame Ernie in 1951, Dame Billy in 1976, and Gertrude Eastman in 1971. Secondly, if you took away the drawn match between Owen Arthur and Sybil Leacock in 1985, no woman has ever lost a by-election in Barbados. Thirdly, when Dame Billy Miller retired from active politics in 2003, after 27 years in the House of Assembly, to add to her five in the Senate, she was then the longest serving, serving member of parliament since the introduction of adult suffrage. Owen Arthur, by successfully contesting the 2008 and the 2013 elections, has since surpassed that. Fourthly, even though it took 20 years for Dame Army's feat to be repeated, the next 47 years has seen 11 women being successful at the polls on 30, 31 different occasions in different constituencies. I would not want to tread on the presentation of Dr. Springer on this occasion, but I think we are fortunate in St. Andrew to have a few persons who knew Dame Ernie well and who interacted with her regularly during her lifetime. I now call on one such person, my mentor and her good friend, Mr. Simeon Belgrove, who will be celebrating his own centenary in 24 years time. <laughs> Whose idea it was to have this lecture and who in his role as chairman of the Ermie Vaughan Foundation has almost single-handedly been the driving force behind this branch, the establishment of the Ermie Bourne Foundation to honor and perpetuate the memory and stewardship of this symbol of our democracy. I now call on Mr. Simeon Balgrove for his presentation. With protocol having been already established, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good night to all of you. And I want to recognize one of Ermie's siblings, Mr. John Foster, who will be 99 at the end of this month.
Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Foster. I am indeed delighted to have all of you gather here in this most beautiful parish of Barbados and within the walls of what I call the University of St. Andrew. I would have called it the University of the Scotland District, but I think that Dale and Charles and Sinti and the others would get a little promotion from it. So let us call it the University of St. Andrew. For the Army Bourne Centennial Lecture, which will be delivered shortly by Dr. Ramez Prince, Senator. When we in the St. Andrew branch of the Barbados Labour Party met to decide how we would commemorate the 100th birthday of Dame Edna, not only was the idea of this lecture born but the seed was planted for the emergence of the Army Bowen Foundation. Army, as she was called in this parish, was a pioneer in her day. And we understood and all agreed that one lecture could not be enough to celebrate and continue the legacy of Army. Army Bowen Foundation is a memorial charity trust honoring the stewardship of the late Dame Edna Armitro Bowen, the first elected female parliamentarian. This nonprofit organization aims to improve the standard of living of the people in St. Andrew and create opportunities for the poor and more vulnerable in rural Barbados and seek to empower females in the community service and public life in this island. These goals and objectives were all embodied in the Edna original plan for both her constituency and the island when she served in the House of Assembly. I am really happy, and if I tell you I am happy, I'm really happy, and I'll tell you why later on too, to be associated with and serve this foundation. Indeed, my reason may be a bit selfish, but if and my memory served me correctly. I am the only surviving member of the original 19 persons who would have joined them, Edna, to establish the St. Andrew branch of the Barbados Labour Party at the now defunct Bell Plain Community Center. Maybe I am the only surviving member because I was the youngest. A 19-year-old excited to join the diehards and to spread the gospel of Sir Grantley Adams and the BLP through these hills and valley of St. Andrew. Then Edna had the distinction of being one of the founding members and the first president of the local arm of the BLP. And I was commissioned to be her secretary. Like many, Army could have said goodbye to the rural community and move to urban or suburban Barbados. She had many offers, but she stayed home because she was dedicated to the improvement of her birthplace. She was committed to the youth like Ming, whom she saw as fundamental to the development of the community, the party, and the island. As we celebrate what would have been her 100th birthday, let us remember her legacy, 
her dedication and commitment to this parish. Let us strive to realize the idea she had and seek to ensure her dreams and hope are future realized. Moreover, let us strive to use her life as an example of service to our community. Honorable Prime Minister, I will say to you, before I close, I knew to say a prayer at night. And it is from a poem I learned at school over 60 years ago. I am content with what you gave, whether it be enough. I am content with what you gave, little be it or much. And Lord, contentment still I crave because thou gavest such. Madam Prime Minister, I would like you to repeat this prayer every day. But not that way. I would like to hear you say, I am content with those who you give me, whether short or tall. <laughs> and Lord, contentment still I crave because you give me all. Now, when I say short or tall, please, please, Honorable Minister George and Honorable Minister Colin, I'm not speaking about you. I have been electioneering in Barbados since 1956, speaking on all platforms. And since 1976, whenever I leave the podium, I say this to people. Through the night of doubt and sorrows onward goes the pilgrim band, singing songs of expectation, marching to the promised land. We are there, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Belgrave. You are indeed a wealth of knowledge. It is at this time, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to get a taste of the talent that resides here in beautiful, beautiful St. Andrew. I want when you leave to remember the melodies from the stage. Our first performer, who, I must say, I'm responsible for his career, is none other than Rodney Small and Ms. Minister King, if you're in the audience. You can attest to that talent that came from here in St. Andrew. So, without much ado, I should allow Mr. Rodney Small to enter the stage. A very special good evening to all those honored guests and each and every one of you here. The song I'm about to do for you is about helping each other, about people loving one another, caring for one another. We, as society changes, we don't see that as much as we, we used to. And we need to get back to that in order to grow. Smiling 
There's nothing you can do Cause what he's asking for you need All you can say is sorry Knowing not how you should be What are you to do You know that this may be the end For a person with no future No one to call a friend I'm asking people Help your brothers and your sisters People Give all you can to With that fall set, I was like, whoa. Our next performer is Miss Kalia Blades, and she is one of our young and upcoming talents. Please welcome Miss Kalia Blades.
Thank you so much, Miss Kelia Blades. Indeed, we have hope in our future entertainers. Barbados is rich with promise. The next entertainer is no stranger to us. I want you, ladies and gentlemen, to put your hands together and welcome Mr. Richard Stout. Sitting here with my eyes on the clock, watching the minutes so slowly tick by. I've been on the job for several hours now, and things are never easy around here. Now every second tells me the end of a day's work is near, and every second brings me. To the best part of my day When I get home with you and the children That will be the best part of my day When I get home with you and the children That will be the best part of my day I can see you Meeting me at the door With a warm and lovely smile on your face With a wide open arm Waiting to touch me and soothingly caress my weary soul. The Lord knows I feel so good when the evening comes and it's time to go home. Home to you, baby. When I get home with you and the children, that will be the best part of my day. When I get home with you and the children, that will be the best part. Of my day You know love can make you happy It can make you sad Love can make you cry It can make you laugh But In every little kiss There's a little teardrop In every single turn There is another heartache And the road is rough The goal gets tough Yes, love is a hurting thing Oh, love is a hurting thing When you're in my arms I'm a king on a throne But when we fall apart I walk the streets alone But I love you so I want you to know I love That love is a hurting thing When love brings so much joy, one must have brings us pain. Yes, it's a mystery that nobody can explain. Well, 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 well. Well, 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 well. Fellas, you have to treat the ladies right. A woman is the most important aspect of our lives. Let's be nice to the ladies at all times. 
I hate to do my woman wrong I just can't bear to I hate to put my woman down For she's so good to me She's proved to me her worthiness In every, every situation It would be fair to make her second best She has to be the only one Be the only one I hate to do my woman wrong I just can't bear to I hate to put my woman down For she's so good to me She proved to me her worthiness In every, every situation It would be fair to make her second best She has to be the only one Be the only one Can you give the band a big round of applause, everybody? Come on. These guys are playing so nice. This is my big song here. 1968 was the year I wrote and recorded it. Tonight I'll sing it in the same key. Yeah. Prove to you I'm going nowhere. I'm right here. Waiting for my Bayesian girl to come back to me. Only a Bayesian girl. A little song that says simply So goodbye now, my Bayesian girl <laughs> Thank you I hope I will see you someday There's some for work I'm really gonna miss you so So goodbye now, my Bayesian girl I hope I will see you someday This time for work, this time for Gonna miss you, baby. So it's goodbye now, little one. You remember this? Do you remember this? The vehicle thing. I can't drive. Well, I'm gonna send you to the black sedan with a puppet inside my car. I'm your vehicle, baby Take it where you want to go I'm your vehicle, woman My mom will show you know And I need you, I want you I want to get you to help you, child Red car, you know I love you You know I do Yeah. 
heaven, you know, you know that I love you. another round of applause. That was awesome. That was indeed awesome. If I was in the bar, I would be dancing too. But um, didn't y'all realize that too? Mr. Penn. And he has a red vest cup underneath. You have some rival now. Our next entertainer is a young gentleman. He is very talented. His name is Mr. Zukili Ennis. And Ms. That's communication between myself and Mr. King. Um, he obviously would have known um, this young gentleman. And I want you all to encourage us as young people coming up with talents and with ideas because we are the next generation that will definitely be taken this country to the next level. So Mr. Zukil Ines.
Thank you so much. Zukili Innes. Just looking to Mr. King. Minister King. Thank you so much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I had said earlier, you had two for the price of one. So I'm going to introduce my other half, Sonia, who will take you from here. Thank you so much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Sandra Oshieng Springer, the wife of our keynote speaker. Dr. Springer is a Kenyan-born political scientist. She earned her doctorate from the University of the West Indies, Cato Campus, Barbados, where she is currently engaged on part-time basis within the Department of Government, Sociology, and Social Work. She teaches courses in Caribbean political economy, international politics and political economy, comparative foreign policy, developed and developing states, and new regionalisms in, gov in global political economy, interdisciplinary perspectives, quite a mouthful. Her research interests include comparative political development, global political economy, identity politics, regional integration and governance in developing states. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as we welcome Dr. Sandra Ochien Springer to the stage to prepare the future presentation for her. Masters of Ceremony, the Prime Minister of Barbados, the Right Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Parliamentary Representative for St. Andrew, the Honorable George Payne, President of the Senate, Senator Sir Richard Cheltenham, Speaker of the House of Assembly, the Honorable Arthur Holder, Members of the Senate, Members of the House of Assembly, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight, the task of introducing the keynote speaker is a special privilege of mine. And it is special because I would have met him over a decade ago as a younger man, and I was struck by, among other things, <laughs> his unwavering determination to work hard and succeed um, to achieve his goals in life, his keen intellect, his desire to help those around him, and his decency as a human being. Senator Dr. Romel Springer was born and has lived in the beautiful constituency of St. Andrew his entire life. He has a unique sense of space with this constituency, and I find that that has helped to shape his consciousness. As a young man coming up in a rural parish, or rural constituency, sorry, the odds were never very or always favorable. However, he grabbed every opportunity he could, and he was determined to succeed at whatever he put his mind to achieving. With this attitude, Senator Dr. Romel Springer went on to graduate from the University of the West Indies with a bachelor's degree in history first class honors, a master's degree in heritage studies with distinction, a doctorate in linguistics with high commendation, and this is not a very easy feat to achieve. He was an educator for several years, and I must say that he enjoyed the interaction with the students and in helping to mold the young minds that he would have interacted with both at the secondary and at the tertiary level. In 2017, Senator Dr. Romel Springer was selected to represent Barbados at the fourth forum of Sino-Latin American and Caribbean young political leader, leaders in China. He is currently the parliamentary represent, sorry, he is currently the par <laughs> I'm foreseeing it, I'm foreseeing <laughs> Sorry, 
rewind. He is currently the Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Technological and Vocational Training. As a young constituent who has distinguished himself, it is only fitting that he delivered this inaugural lecture on Dem Ermi Bourne, a political stalwart in this constituency and in this country on whose shoulders Dr. Senator Romel Springer and indeed the rest of us all stand on. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Senator Dr. Romel Springer. Masters of Ceremony, Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Mia Amor Motley, QC, MP, Minister of Finance, Economic Affairs and Investment, the Honorable Dale Marshall, Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Parliamentary Representative for St. Andrew, the Honorable George Walton Payne, Minister of Housing, land and rural development. Members of the cabinet, President of the Senate, Senator Sir Richard Cheltenham, Speaker of the House of Assembly, the Honorable Arthur Holder, Members of the Senate, Members of the National Executive Council, Barbies Labour Party family, specially invited guests, Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And welcome to St. Andrew. Now this evening, it is my pleasure to speak about this icon of Barbadian politics, Dame Ermie Bourne, a lady who has represented a constituency that I am fortunate to be a member of and a party that I am proud to be associated with. I would like at the outset to thank the Ermie Bourne Foundation and its patron, the Honorable George Walton Payne, as well as the St. Andrew branch of the Barbados Labour Party for giving me this opportunity to, um, to, pay, to, give, to pay this honor to Dame Ermie Bourne in this way for her stalwart contribution to Barbados. On the 18th of December, 1991, the political landscape of Barbados changed forever. For the first time in the nation's history, and in 312 years of parliament, a black woman assumed her place in the hollow halls of the House of Assembly, thereby occupying a space that had previously only accommodated men. Egna Ermintrude Foster was born right here in Belle Plaine, St. Andrew on August 4th, 1918 to Dari and Elizabeth Foster. Her father was a vestryman and a BLP representative for St. Andrew in the years 1946 to 1950. It was with him that Ermie Bourne would have gotten her first exposure to politics. From this point on, I will be referring to Dame Ermie Bourne as Ermie Bourne or simply Ermie as she was popularly known. It is noteworthy to mention at this early stage that emerging out of the Foster family were, and by extension, St. Andrew, were two other prominent um, parliamentarians, namely Her Excellency Ambassador Elizabeth Thompson, who served as the representative for the constituency of St. James South in the years between 1994 and 2008. And later, the Honorable Edmund Hickson, 
who is currently the representative for St. James North. And I think it's fair to say at this point that St. Andrew has produced one of the most prolific political families in the history of this country, if not the most prolific political, fa uh, political family. Before I begin to speak about Hermes' contribution, I think it's important to place this speech within a certain historical context. We therefore must consider the time period in which Hermes participated in politics before we speak of anything else. And we must also examine some of the socio, uh, socio economic and political realities during her time. Ermi Bourne represented something momentous on the political landscape of this country. Women in politics in the 1950s were perceived as unconventional, to say the least. And this is because of the traditional confinement of women to the private sphere. Women were primarily seen in their roles of wives, partners, mothers, homemakers. Ermi Bourne being a product of her time, she conformed to these norms for a brief period, period when she gave up her teaching profession to raise a family for her husband, Ivan Bourne. Although public life was reinforced as the domain of men, Ermi broke into this domain when she took on a political role in the 1940s. Her involvement in national politics in the 1950s was nothing short of exceptional given the extent of women's marginalization in the political arena. Women's exclusion from the decision-making processes was primarily because of the patriarchal male-dominated um, system that embodied colonial administration where local politics was dominated by, a plan by plantation owners and merchants of British descent. Moreover, the political system had built-in disqualifications, including high property and wage disqualifications that excluded women from the vote from as far back as 1697. This patriarchal system continued well into the 1930s when the movement for political rights was crystallized through the formation of the Barbados Labour Party in 1938. Changes in legislation gradually allowed for female participation, but these changes were minimal in the initial stages. It was not until 1948 for example, that women were included as candidates for local office and as voters in local elections. The extension of the franchise to all citizens after the Declaration of Universal Adult Suffrage in 1950 transformed politics in Barbados by increasing the voters' base. However, women's political participation largely involved the casting of votes and the supporting of male candidates. But there was a dearth of female involvement at the higher levels of the political process and at the decision-making level. Other critical events that took place in the 1930s would have been the 1937 labor rebellions. These riots challenged, amongst other things, the horrendous living conditions of the West Indians across the Caribbean. They also set in motion an anti-colonial revolutionary struggle across the region that was instrumental in ensuring in a number of political and socio-economic reforms in many Caribbean islands, including Barbados. Sir Arthur Lewis, in his analysis of the conditions that sparked the riots, stated that the earnings of laborers were so low that they only permitted subsistence at a deplorable level. According to George Bell, wages for agricultural workers were eight pence a day. A tradesman earned two shillings and six pence per day. And domestic workers, who I assume comprise of women, earned eight shillings a month. As you can tell, 
as low as the wages were for men, women were subjected to even lower wages. After Lewis further noted that the evidence of these low wages jumped to the eye in the ragged clothing, dilapidated housing, and the undernourished conditions of the masses and their children, there was practically no legislation concerning housing or working conditions, and there were hardly ever enough schools for the children. The distribution of income was most inequitable, and the poverty of the masses contrasted sharply with the luxury and splendor of the landed aristocracy. The 1945 Moin Commission report also lamented the deplorable living conditions of the populace and the unfair working conditions that they face. From my calculations, Ermi was in her mid to late teens um, during the riots, and many of the conditions mentioned would have been a live reality for her, especially as one who lived in a rural parish such as St. Andrew. In March 1951, Ermi's father, Derry Foster, died, creating a vacant seat that prompted the BLP government to seek a replacement. The BLP initially sought out Siebert World for the by election, an election that he ultimately lost. However, it was said that on the campaign trail, Ermi was asked to introduce arts to represent the party in the upcoming general election. That's why I'm glad that my wife was the person who introduced me tonight. <laughs> now, Ermi was not too keen on running in this election, but she was encouraged by the words of her, of her father, who before he died had told her that he wanted her to go there and help the people of St. Andrew. So on Thursday, December 13th, 1951, the people of Barbados went to the polls in the first election since universal adult suffrage. And Ermi emerged as the overall winner with 1,372 1, votes and was, le was elected as the senior member of the House for St. Andrew. Now, notwithstanding her mammoth achievement, because it was a mammoth achievement, Ermi was the victim of gendered media. While her win was outstanding and newsworthy, Many media houses failed to carry the story. Despite hardly getting any media coverage, news of her historic victory reached the masses. The excitement of the first female elected as a member of parliament was not lost on the public, nor was it lost on the good people of St. Andrew. Her entry into parliament was heralded by one of the largest crowds ever assembled to see any member of parliament assume office. In an article by Harold Hoyt, Ermi recalled the day she entered the house for the first time. I was almost torn apart. The people had come up to see the first woman in Parliament, and the police had to come and get me. My supporters were pulling me one way and the police the other. Then they had to sneak me up in a car that wasn't mine and to meet mine at Queen's Park. When the people realized it, they tried to block the car. Oh, that was some time. I can only assume that Ermi's time in Parliament was interesting, working in a male-dominated environment. However, not being one to complain about her situation, and understanding that she was a pioneer in her field, when asked about how it felt to be the only female member of the House of Assembly, she stated that she did not find it strange. Having been socialized around males, it was not a rare occurrence to her. This quotation from her gives greater insight into her experience. Well, it was nothing unusual for me to be among men because I was from a very large family and I grew up among the majority of boys and men. My mother had six boys and 10 of us. I used to go around with my father and the majority of people who used to come home to him for political reasons were men. She was never one to back down from a challenge. Nor was she easily intimidated by her colleagues. However, it was reported that on some occasions she had to drink a shot of bourbon just to get through the day. Yeah, the fellas gave her a rough thing. Ermi did not just set precedent for women in Barbados, but for many other women 
across this region and beyond. Indeed, she was the first black woman to be elected to national legislature in the Caribbean, in North America, and in Central America. She paved the way for other regional women, including Isabel Ursula Tashia, who was a member of parliament in Trinidad and Tobago in 1961, from 1961 to 1970. Mabel Moore James, member of parliament in Dominica in 1966. Dane Eugenia Charles in 1970, who later became prime minister in 1980. And even Shirley Chisholm, who became the first black woman elected to the United States Congress in 1968. And Dame Eugenia Charles, our very own um, Dame Billy Miller, who was elected in 1976. Ermie Bourne's political career took place at a very interesting time. This being just 14 years after the 1937 Rex and three years after the release of the 1945 Moyn Commission report which recommended, amongst other things, that rural housing should be provided for the poor people and that minimum wages should be set. It also recommended that reforms in the health, sanitation, and education system, systems should be established. And these are the very same things that Ermi lobbied for in the House of Assembly. During this period, Barbados was undergoing the turbulence of decolonization and nation building. The Barbados Labour Party was trained to form and, form and restructure institutions that reflected the wishes of the masses. They were trained to make the political system more democratic, more representative, and at the same time, trained to deal with some of the many injustices that still prevail. There's no doubt in my mind that Ermi Burns Ermi Bourne's worldview, values, and belief, systems, belief system was guided and shaped by these notions of self-determination, social justice, and empowerment. Her political activism was warranted. I will now turn my attention to some of the social programs that Ermi undertook right here in Belle Plaine and in the St. Andrew area. In St. Andrew, but mainly in the Belle Plaine and surrounding areas. Parliamentary representative for St. Andrew, the Honorable George Payne, described Ermi Bourne as one of the first social engineers in Barbados. Unfortunately, a lot of what um, Ermi Bourne would have done has never really been recorded in any texts, has never really been documented, cannot be found in any library in Barbados. And with the passage of time, a lot of her efforts and a lot of her initiatives have faded from memory. Fortunately, there are still some persons um, living right here in, in Belle Plaine and other places who would have benefited directly from some of the initiatives and programs that Ermi Bourne uh, would have put in place. One such person is Mr. Simeon Belgriff, who you would have met earlier the chairman of the Ermi Bourne Foundation, who would have furnished me with a great deal of the anecdotal information that I will speak about in this segment of the lecture. Without his wealth of knowledge and experience, I would have been hard pressed to find someone with the enthusiasm and the, the passion for, for the preservation of the legacy of Ermi Bourne. At this time, I would like to personally acknowledge Mr. Belgriff and thank him for his contribution. Many of Ermi's programs started after she was elected as the first female member of the St. Andrew's Vestry in 1948. The Vestry provided Ermi with a face-to-face -face context of the many problems that the people within her community um, faced. But more importantly, it served as a stepping stone for her to move up to the national level. Ermi Bourne was never appointed as a cabinet minister when she won her seat in 1951 or 1956. But this did not hinder her from representing the concerns of the people of St. Andrew. During her 10 years in Parliament, 
Ermi was able to use her office and her influence to improve the circumstances and living conditions of the poor people of St. Andrew. Ermi was disheartened by the levels of poverty and the appalling conditions under which people live in St. Andrew. She recalled this reality to a reporter in 1989 when she mentioned that people live in what they call rotten damp houses. These houses were built of rotten cane and cane trash and dirt. It was this awareness of the hardship that people face that further shaped the path, her path towards political activism under the Barbados Labour Party in order to, in her own words, help do something. In that same interview, Ermi also mentioned that there were only a few standpipes in St. Andrew and people had to walk really long distances to their homes with a pail of, of water in order to bathe or to wash or to cook and, and such like. The fact was there were only two standpipes in this Belpin area. One was right there by the corner by the Ermibourne Highway and the other was down by the by the corner of Boy, um, Boy School Road. Ermi saw how difficult it was for persons to obtain this basic necessity and set about ensuring that the tenantry roads got access to running water. To achieve this, she lobbied for the laying of a four inch main into each of the tenantries. And each tenantry was then given a standpipe. Eventually, persons living in those areas were able to get running water into their homes. She also understood the importance of community development. And very early in her tenure, Ermi constructed the Belle Plain Social Center, or shall I say the now defunct Belle Plain Social Center, which included the pavilion and the playing field, as well as a, a number of community baths. Ermi was of the view that these facilities and these amenities were available to, to persons in other districts in Barbados, and she felt that they should be made available to the people of St. Andrew as well. Ermi also placed infrastructural development high on her agenda and did a lot of work in the Belle Plain and surrounding areas. One of her major undertakings was the raising of the Belle Plain Main Road from by the Rockland down to the bridge close to the St. Andrew's Parish Church. Before the Belpin Road was upgraded, it was about, from what I'm told, about three to four feet lower than where it actually is now. So it was two to four feet lower than the houses with embankments on both sides. So during downpours, when there was heavy rain, the road would often flood and persons were trapped in their homes Children could not get out to go to school. If they were at school, they could not get home. Ermi saw this as a serious and unnecessary inconvenience and lobbied for the upgrading of the road, a feat that she accomplished in her first term. Ermi was also successful in having concrete culverts and drains constructed in Belle Plaine to facilitate the easy runoff of water. I guess we can boast that Belle Plaine in the 1950s had wall gutters even before some places in Bridgetown. But more importantly, today Belle Plaine is no longer um, considered a flood prone area because of Ermi's efforts. Apart from the Belle Plaine Main Road, Ermi was also instrumental in constructing a number of tenantry roads. When Ermi came to office in 1951, many of the roads in St. Andrew were just cat roads or mud tracks. And it was her who started a road building campaign in order to improve access to the tenantries. Roads like Franklin Douglas Tenantry Road, Isolation Road, Boys School Road, Babylon Road, and Redmond Road are just some of the roads that Ermi would have constructed, but there were many, many more. Another major concern of Ermi was the erosion that was taking place in the Scotland district. She lobbied and eventually convinced the Grant Adams administration that something had to be done about the land slippage that was a constant threat to many districts in and around the Belle Plaine area. In some measure, because of her agitation, the Soil Conservation Commission was established in 1957. 
to deal with the many cases of soil erosion in places like Bosco Bell, Springville, Borders, and Sedge Pond, just, just to name a few. Ermi also paid special attention to the condition of the bridges in St. Andrew. She was of the view that Bell Plain could be easily cut off at any time if these bridges were damaged or if they were allowed to collapse. So she ensured that there were regular inspections and if by chance any damage was found, Ermi ensured that this damage was uh, repaired post haste. Not only was Ermi intimately involved and actively involved in the maintenance of the physical infrastructure in St. Andrew. She was also involved in a number of social programs geared towards the improvement and well-being of the people within her community. Ermi was instrumental in getting the Girls Industrial Union to come to St. Andrew and to hold classes right here in the Aline School and over by the pavilion to teach young ladies in the community and young girls in the community things like needlework, arts and crafts, and other skills. She was also equally successful in getting the House Craft Center to come to St. Andrew to provide training for the people within this community. Now, before her intervention, there were persons with, with those skills. But with these programs, persons were able to get some form of certification for their skills, very similar to what we are trying to do with our CVQ programs in the Ministry of Education. Some of the audience may actually remember that these classes were held by the Bell Plain Boys School before they were later moved over here to the Allen School. Ermi saw the need for, at the very least, a healthcare professional to service the Bell Plain area. She requested that a district nurse be stationed at the Bell Plain Arms House to provide healthcare to the community. She was also instrumental in instituting a community nurse system whereby if a person was sick and was unable to get to the Amps house for treatment or get to a doctor, a nurse would be fetched who would come to your home and would provide treatment right there at your home. This was extremely beneficial, as you may imagine, for the elderly in the community. But it was equally beneficial for the women, especially during childbirth and in cases where the women did not have, or the woman did not have access to a midwife. Many women also traveled to the Amps house to give birth. Ermi had a special maternity ward um, built for that purpose. And just on, on Thursday, I met a young lady from the constituency who told me that her mother told her that she was born right there in the Amps house and not in the hospital, like me, for example. <laughs> Ermi was also able to encourage Lady Adams, then Grace Adams, and Clyde Gollop to come to St. Andrew and teach family planning to the young women in the community. These, um, this family planning initiative was aimed towards empowering women with knowledge to avoid unwanted and unintended pregnancies, which were pretty much commonplace back in the 50s. Despite her busy schedule, Ermi still maintained close relations with her constituents. Every few months, Ermi held meetings at the pavilion or the community center so persons could come out and air their views and air their concerns as well. On occasion, she would travel to the Bell Plain area to greet and to rub shoulders with her constituents. Yes, it started way back in the 50s. It was on these visits that Ermi um, would sometimes go and greet the patients and the residents at the Arts House. Now I'm going to stick a pin there. As I said in the beginning, a lot of this information is anecdotal. It was, it was not documented anywhere. But I was told that on one occasion, Ermi went to the Arts House and she saw that persons in, in that facility were not being treated. The residents and patients were not being treated properly. And the nourishment um, in terms of the food was not was not up to standard. Persons were allowed to walk around in old clothes and um, dirty clothes. And Ermi being the no-nonsense person that she was, because she was a no-nonsense person, she then went about setting up uh, and was successful in setting up a commission of inquiry into the operations of the Bell Plain Arts House. And in my research, I uh, found a person who actually gave testimony at the 
at the Commission of Inquiry had to go over there by the community centre to give testimony about what you will have seen at the Amps House. A number of reforms were put in place as a result of that inquiry. Ermin was able to coordinate all of these events and, this, and these activities without the use of a telephone. Even as a parliamentarian, Ermin did not have a telephone in her home. And there was only one functioning telephone in Bell Plain in 1951 that was accessible to the public. And that was located in the Bell Plain police station. In fact, Ermi, in an estimate debate, estimates debate in 1955, argued that government should take urgent steps to install telephones for the convenience of the public, not only in St. Andrew, but in other districts where there were no phones. She also argued that the police in the police station here in Belpin should be given some form of motor vehicle. Because in those days, police were forced to either walk or ride bicycle. And St. Andrew being the hilly type of, have, having the hilly type of terrain that it does, you can imagine how difficult it was for police to, let's say, ride from Bell Plain to Rock Hall, St. Andrew. You know, that's a fairly good pull. When the policemen get to the location, in most cases, too tired to carry out his duties, yeah, <laughs> effectively. It's true. Ermi was also responsible for bringing a magist the first magistrate court to the Bell Plain. And prior to that, persons wanting to, hear, uh, wanted to have their cases heard had to trek all the way up to Bissett Hill in St. Joseph at District F Magistrate Court in order to seek justice. And she felt that this was unreasonable especially for persons who live in the northern part of the constituency in places like Boscobel. She, Ermi, cared. <laughs> Ermi's response to the devastation caused by Hurricane Janet was also a turning point in her political career and no doubt contributed to her returning to the House of Assembly in 1956. It was during this time that she really showed her mettle and her commitment to the people of St. Andrew. When Hurricane Jeanette struck in 1955, it devastated large parts of Barbados, mainly in the south of the island, but also here in St. Andrew because of the already dilapidated housing stock that, were, that was here in this parish. Many homes were either totally destroyed or they lost their roofs. Ermi got directly involved in the restoration process, in the restoration effort. She kept a lot of the material right on her property, and it was not uncommon to see Ermi amongst the lorries, as they were called back then, checking to ensure that the lumber that was, was on that truck and that that lumber was, was going to the persons who needed, who needed it. She was sometimes seen behind the trucks, just driving behind the trucks to ensure that that material got to where it was supposed to go to. <laughs> yeah, she was very hands-on. I think it was around this time that the term storm carpenter was coined. Now, a, star a storm carpenter referred to a person who before the hurricane was not a carpenter, but after the hurricane quickly became a carpenter so they can get some work during the restoration process. After Hurricane Janet, another major undertaking carried out by Ermi was the Belplain housing area. Housing was especially important to Ermi Bourne, having seen the squalor that had befallen her people for so many years and the devastation that was caused by the hurricane. She was able to draw on a number of initiatives, such as the General Workers Housing Loan Fund and the newly formed National Housing Authority, to assist with the building of the housing area and the rebuilding of houses in the surrounding communities. Ermi clearly understood her mandate and constantly insisted on the modernization of St. Andrew. In fact, Ermi was the first person to introduce waterborne facilities to the masses here in the Bell Plain area. In the 1950s, this was a 
a luxury that was enjoyed only by a small few. For over a decade, Ermi established herself as a steadfast champion of the people. And at no time wavered in her support for the people who elected her to parliament. After her exit from elective politics in 1961, Ermi still continued to, pay, to play an active role in the party. In 1962, Ermi formed the first constituency branch in St. Andrew and was its first president, as was mentioned earlier by Mr. Belgriff, who was its first um, secretary. Ermi used this office to bring awareness of the parties of the party and the party's policy to the people of St. Andrew. And I'm going to tell you a story that I was told during my research. In those days, the only information reaching St. Andrew was via the beacon, which um, Ermi would have supplied to the, provided to the people in, in the area. Other than that, if you wanted to know what was going on in the party, you had to travel to the city. Now, in those days, just like today, most uh, political meetings started around 7, 8 o'clock. But the last bus to St. Andrew was around 8, 9 o'clock. So persons from St. Andrew could not stick around and enjoy or, or could not stick around and listen to the, to the political uh, speeches. They had to get home. So what she did, she created a facility where persons could still be made aware of what was going on in, in Barbados right here in St. Andrew, right there in the Belle Plain um, Pavilion. In the years that follow, she was a mentor for the BLP candidates that came after her, came after her, namely Elbury Braffitt, who she actually canvassed for, and who she spoke on his political platform, which in my mind was a high-risk maneuver for him, given Ermi's history. There's a possibility that Tom Adams might have asked Ermi to run in the 1976 elections <laughs> instead of Elbury Braffitt. She was also a mentor for our very own George Walton Payne, who, um, who she formed a close friendship with during the 1990s. And I do not know if Mr. Payne knows this, but a relative of Ermi told me that Ermi felt that Mr. Payne was the best representative that this constituency has, has ever had. Yes, yeah, she actually said that. She was also a source of inspiration for, for us here in St. Andrew, in the St. Andrew branch of the BLP. Our branch office is named after her. On November 30th, 1995, 44 years after she ascended the steps of Parliament, Ermi was knighted and bestowed with the island's highest honor. In her case, the aptly named Dame of St. Andrew. A few months later, on August 26, 1996, almost August 23rd, sorry, 1996, she was immortalized when the East Coast Road was named in her honor as the Ermi Bourne Highway. Dane Egna Urbantrude Bourne passed away at the age of 81 on January 23rd, 2000. Tonight, I pay tribute to Ermi Bourne in the month that she would have celebrated her 100th birthday had she remained on this physical plane. I recognize Ermi was the first woman to accomplish many things. I recognize that she fought tirelessly for the people of St. Andrew. But at the same time, and in the same vein, I also acknowledge all the women who struggled, who supported, and who were actively involved in the development of this country. Ermi Bourne did not only appeal to people living in St. Andrew, you know. Rather, her presence and contributions in Parliament were much more far-reaching than we have given her credit for. Her values were not only her own, but represented the shared values 
of countless numbers, numbers of disenfranchised and voiceless Barbadians. She was in every sense the voice of the voiceless. Ermie Bourne was the first woman to really change the political landscape of Barbados in any meaningful way, breaking taboos, disrupting the status quo, and rewriting the narrative on Caribbean politics. And Ermie Bourne's contribution came at the tail end of a long-standing debate about whether a woman could properly represent a constituency in Barbados. But she proved her detractors and the naysayers wrong. Her struggles should never be forgotten. Former Prime Minister Owen Seymour Arthur is on record as saying that she was a standard bearer for those who came after her. He further stated that one of Ermi's main contributions was that she broke the barrier that stood in the way of women of her day and paved the way for other women who came after her. As this party celebrates its 80th anniversary, it is only fitting that I mention its role in bringing greater representation to women in politics. From its very inception, the Barbados Labour Party recognized the influence and importance of Barbadian women and encouraged them to play a more active and engaging role in the development of the party. Under the leadership of Sir Grantley Adams, the Barbados Labour Party championed the cause of women as it relates to political enfranchisement. It is no surprise, therefore, that some of the most outstanding female politicians this country has ever produced got their start and represented this very same party, the Barbados Labour Party. <laughs> Apart from Ermi, the BLP was the first party to run a female candidate in 1944. It was the first party to appoint a woman to the Legislative Council in 1948. And it was the first party to appoint a female cabinet minister in 1976. The BLP is also on record of having, for having appointed the most female cabinet ministers in the history of this country, beginning with Billy Miller, if I may refer to her as Billy Miller, Mia Motley and Liz Thompson. In recent time, a number of women, elected women, joined the ranks of parliamentarians and cabinet ministers. These included Cynthia Ford, Marsha Cattle, Sandra Husbands, Dr. Sonia Brown, and Santia Bradshaw, who remains in our prayers tonight. The recent appointment of Senator Lucy Moore and Kay McConney as cabinet ministers is further testament to the fact that we as a party continue to be progressive. Clearly, one of the most outstanding manifestations of the party's efforts to elevate women in public life is our very own Mia Amor Motley. <laughs> Who now serves as Barbados' first female prime minister? Now, as I listen to her and all the other female parliamentarians give their submissions in Parliament, I see them as true testaments to the legacy of Dame Ermie Bourne. It is without doubt that the spirit of Ermie Bourne resides in each and every one of them. 67 years later, we are in a better position in terms of our democracy. And we have seen the benefits of the active participation of women in the decision-making process at the highest level. I challenge us, therefore, to continue to be inspired by the spirit of Dame Ermi Bourne and to overcome any obstacle placed in our way. Let us continue believing that we can be more than we are expected to be that we can go further than we are expected to go, and that we can achieve more than we, than, than we are expected to achieve, despite our circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Senator Dr. Rommel Springer. It is at this time that we will have a short question and answer segment. So those of you who would have questions for Senator Dr. Rommel Marshall, Springer. sorry, Springer, please forgive me. <laughs> please forgive me. For set, any questions for Senator Dr. Rommel Springer, Yes. You may ask those questions now. That's cool. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Springer, um, Dave. Dame Ermin Bourne being the first female elected in the House of Assembly. She created history in 1951. 67 years later, Barbados has its first female Prime Minister, the Honorable Mayor Amor Motley. What do you think that Dame Ermin Bourne would say to her say that she created history as the first female prime minister in Barbados, saying she had a way with words. <laughs> oh, you start with a really good question. <laughs> um, I believe any conversation between um, Prime Minister Motley and Dean Ermi will have to involve the, the subject of of the role of women and leadership. I think that um, Demi Bourne would, would, firstly, she would congratulate Mayor Moore Motley on her achievement, but then she would encourage her not to be distracted by, by persons, by her detractors, and that she would encourage her to stay focused on the task at hand, being that the task is so difficult at this time. I also think that she would tell her something that I know that Prime Minister uh, Motley already knows. And that is, as a woman Prime Minister, or as a woman, she would have to work twice as hard to be considered half as good as her male counterparts. <laughs> I have another question for you, Dr. Springer. It's from all in the back. How do you think Irby Bourne would fare now in this political atmosphere in 2018 if she was still alive? Mm. Well, I, I, I <clears throat> were Irby Bourne still alive, I think that she, in this particular Era, this particular atmosphere, um, post May 24th, I think that she would do pretty well. Um, for one, she would have a, a platform to air her views. Uh, I think we have progressed a, a, a lot since the 1950s in terms of where women, how women are seen in, in, in society. She would have a lot more company in Parliament for sure. And she will have persons to share her views to help discuss um, issues pertaining to women. I, I think, um, given her, her the number of initiatives that 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 Ermi would have put in place as as a woman in 1950s, her presence in this era where women are are not judged based on, on, on gender but on merit, I think she would fit right in. I think she would feel right at home in, um, in 2018 Barbados based on her views. She was always into empowering women. And I see a Barbados where women are being empowered. I see a Barbados where women are operating at the highest level, both in the public and in the private sphere. So I suspect 
that she would, she would fare very well in this current atmosphere. I have no doubt about it. Thank you. Good evening, um, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Springer. Thank you for a tremendous walk. Um, I could say memory lane, but since I wasn't there, mm -hmm. but telling that story energized me in an interesting way, and I got goosebumps. Thank you. You, you make the relationship between Dame Ermey and Prime Minister Motley and the numbers of women enfranchised, if you would, in the decision-making process. I'd like you to think and perhaps share with us how we can take this um, journey, the next step. Because on the one hand, I semi-disagree with you that women are seen as leaders, particularly in the political sphere, at the highest level, insufficiency of number. But I'm more interested in how could we use what you have shared tonight, the experiences of the present with the most tremendous leader in the Caribbean and world, as far as I'm concerned, along with the other team of women and men, to advance the numbers as it relates to parliamentary representation through the election process. Maybe you could give us a thought how we can take this story out there further, because the room really still is about 50 on average, and very few beyond, below 50 women who may be inspired to go forward in this space. And this is a tremendous and important lecture. Thank you. I think we have to first acknowledge that we really have progressed. But at the same time, we must acknowledge that there are persons who do not appreciate the extent that women, women have come in the last few years. I think we need a change of attitude. That is the first step. We can change, we can, we can enact legislation, but we have to change the attitude of persons in order to make that next step. Where all persons appreciate women um, based on merit as opposed to gender. And any, anything that we do has to be a cultural change. We cannot um, legislate this, this type of, of progressiveness that we are, that we are that you, you're hoping to move towards. But I take the point that there are not enough uh, female representation in Parliament. Right now we stand at about 21%. And ideally, according to the United Nations, it should be around 30%. But I think we are moving in that direction. And with a leader like Mia, Mia Moore Motley to give inspiration to all the um, so many, the young persons, young women, young females in this country, I have no doubt that we will be there in, in short time. Good night. I wanted to, from a historical point of view, If you can make a correlation between um, Dame Ermy Bourne's election, being, having been elected to political life, if there's a correlation between her here in Barbados and to um, other Caribbean islands, and if so, what impact, if there, what impact is, has been made between the Right. Um, I think I, I would have alluded to the fact that Ermi did not only set precedent in, in Barbados, um, but her, her influence extended beyond these shores and beyond this region. It was only after Ermi came into public life that you, we started seeing, um, almost a decade afterwards, that we st started seeing the emergence of female parliamentarians. I, I believe that persons throughout this Caribbean look as, at Ermi as an example of, of a strong woman. And by the way, the name Ermintrude actually means strong. It means universal strength in, in German. So, I mean, that, and that's a, a fact that I'm sure was not lost on Ermi's parents when they gave her that name. So they saw her as a strong voice for women. And they used that to draw inspiration to enter into public life. And you saw 
immediately afterwards, in 1961 in Trinidad, in 1966 again in, 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 in Dominica, in 1970 within Eugenia Charles in Dominica again. And, and, and in Barbados, we saw the emergence of, of women putting themselves out there in public life to represent. So I, I think that, that she would have had an impact on people throughout the Caribbean. And I almost forgot um, Shirley Chisholm in 1968. You know, she has roots to Bar in, in Barbados. Her roots are here in Barbados. And she was elected in 1968, um, a few years after uh, Ermi left elective politics. So I think she also would have drawn on Ermi's strength, Ermi's voice, strong voice, as a source of inspiration to put herself out there in public life. So yes, they're, they're, there's no doubt in my mind that her ascension into the House of Assembly would have had a positive impact on women throughout the Caribbean. Romel. Uh, yes, sir. Family. Wish to congratulate you on an extremely uh, enlightening address and congratulate the St. Andrew BLP branch and um, patron, uh, Minister Payne, for this evening. Um, I, of course, as you said, stand as a successor in terms of the Foster family to the political heritage of Dame Ermi, and I start as a proud person, um, the fourth member of that family in elected parliament. And, you know, the significance and magnitude of her really is, as George said, was that it was another, it took another 20 years before a female was elected to parliament in Barbados, and she was elected at age 33. I mean, there are there are very few people still who are elected at that young age. Our Prime Minister being one was less than that. Um, Dame Ermi's own niece, as you said, Liz, was elected around that time, and Dame Billy. And it's significant most of them, in fact, are, are women and not men. Um, I know, as you said, that there isn't much documented evidence in terms of her political career. But, of course, she was a member of... A, a tremendous BLP team which socially transformed Barbados in the 50s. And I, I was wondering if you were able to come up with research as to her role within the ruling Barbados Labour Party government in terms of contribution to debates on the social transformation, uh, things like the um, Located Labourers Act, removing, you know, the the, when, that, when tenants left the plantations, they had to uh, stop working at the plantations and um, all the workers' rights legislation, mm -hmm. whether you were able to also research into the role she played in Parliament in those debates. What I can tell you is that um, even before, I, just before I came here, I was sent some, some information from some debates that she would have taken um, she would, she would have engaged in, in the in parliament. Um, Ermi, she, 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 she was a backbencher and she spoke, she seldom spoke on issues that were um, issues outside of St. Andrew. As long as it involved St. Andrew, she would speak. But one of the things that she was proud to, to be a part of was the Vacation with Pay Act. She often spoke about that as one of her um, greater achievements. Because before that uh, person's, this, the concept of, of being on vacation and being paid was alien and, and, and to persons, especially here in, in the rural part, the rural parts of, the, of, of Barbados. So that is one example I can think of right off the top of my head that she would have been involved with and she was actively, um, in, she actively, actively engaged in that debate. But her, most of her debates dealt with, with issues pertaining to the situation in St. Andrew, based on what I would have seen in the records. And I asked for every debate that could be found about Ermi Bourne. But I'm sure she would have, been, she would have engaged in other, in other debates and other um, aspects of the party in terms of reforms.
Thank you so much. There's, there's one last question. Good afternoon, Mr. Springer. Good afternoon, sir, Dr. Springer. I met you last year, but I don't know if you remember me. My daughter went to your school, Frederick Smith, and I met you last year, and now you are a doctor, a minister for the government, and I salute you for your hard work. Because when you meet people not they, and then the next year you see them in a different way, you have to give them a round of applause for their effort. And I salute you. But there, I, I see you're doing something good as an MP for this parish, and that is very... <laughs> as a minister, as a minister, as a minister for this parish, and I salute you, right? But in my, in my view, what I'm looking at, I'm a Jamaican. We, we, say, we say MPs, right? So, we, so it's both, right? But what I'm saying is that what I see you doing here is a good thing. I think what you're gathering for this lady, history, you need to make a book and put it into school for the kids to learn. And, and a next point, this can be a development within tourism for the parish. Just like how you have a Rihanna Drive, all of what this lady has done for this parish and this country needs to go into tourism. So when people come off the cruise, people come on the plane, they're going to say, listen, I'm going to that parish to see what this lady has done for Barbados. When, when, they, are doing, when they are doing their tour around Barbados, they need to come into this parish and see what this lady has done. It helped the community also. Everyone who can do craft, everyone can run in their shop, can, a tourist can come there, buy something, and develop this community in a very, very, very positive way and get some working going on for the community. I just want to say thank you for your comment. And the Ermi Bourne Foundation has taken a first step in that regard. As a lexicographer, as a linguist, I am of the belief that stories should be documented. And I, I would have mentioned earlier in my lecture that um, unfortunately, a lot of what Ermi would have done here in this community has not been documented. And I strongly believe that it should be, if not for us, but for the edification of future generations of Barbadians. And as you said, for tourists, um, persons would come here, they would see the highway, they should know about the woman, about the person at Ar Army Born. And I can tell you, I was not going to mention it, but in my discussions with persons over the past few weeks, I discovered that a lot of people know very little about Ermi Bourne. So this lecture is even more important for that reason. We have to tell her story. It is important. So I appreciate your statement and your comment, and I'm going to do what I can to ensure that this information in this lecture is perhaps published maybe in the um, conference magazine if it's not too late. But I'm going to make it available to the public because this, this information, I got, as I said, a lot of it from Mr. Belgriff. And Mr. Belgriff, he has been telling me for a long time, I'm sure he has been telling Mr. Payne for an even longer time that he does not have much more time up here with us. <laughs> well, down here with us. So we have to... to to capture that information. It's important that we capture that information. Um, I think I, I saw Mr. Sherwood in the audience, and I will tell you, I had a number of conversations with Mr. Sherwood McCaskey about interviewing this man and recording this man and, and having this, this information documented so that persons will have access to it. Because, as I said, I was hard-pressed 
to find persons who knew anything about Ermiborn. So I take your point, and I will ensure that the little bit that I have here, because she has done, she did a lot more than I could document. When I first wrote this speech, it was over an hour and 15 minutes long. I had to cut it down. So I had to cut out some information, a lot of other um, things that she would have done right here in the community that I had to take out of this. So I will ensure that that information is documented and, and put it in the book. All right? Thank you. I want to thank Do Senator Dr. Rommel Springer. I got it right. He did a very good job. I purposely didn't want to know too much because I wanted him to be the first to enlighten me about Dame about Dame, Ed, Dame Ermie Bourne, and I must say, um, I wanted to ask him a question, but it probably would take too long, but nonetheless, um, I, personally, I see her as an inspiration, but equally, the next person I'm going to invite on stage is an inspiration now for us as women, not only in politics, but in terms of being strong, inspiring to make a difference, and to leave a legacy. And with that being said, I would like to invite the Honorable Maya Amor Mortley, QC, MP, on stage, the Prime Minister of Barbados. And she will give the closing remarks. Thank you. Thanks. That's good. That's good. Thank you very much. President of the Senate, Sir Richard Cheltenham. Speaker of the House of Assembly, members of Cabinet, members of the Barbados Labour Party, friends, all. It is, George, a humbling moment that as chairman of this party, you arranged for us to be here this evening to recognize the centennial of the birth of Ermie Bourne. But for me, at a very personal level, it is a very moving moment because I am conscious and sensitive to the fact that that woman who many of us believed blazed the trail, and I am sorry that Billy isn't here this evening. I don't see her and for whom Billy followed blazing another trail in cabinet, that they really represent the inspiration that unlocked more than 50% of the potential of this country. Today, this morning, we started the day at the Barbados Workers' Union, and as we celebrate 80 years, they too celebrate 77 years this weekend. And it was noticed by the General Secretary that today was a unique moment at Solidarity House, for it was a female General Secretary, the first in the Union, introduced by a female President of the Union, the first in the Union, to a female Prime Minister, the first in the country, and that it was coming against the background of the centennial lecture for the first female member of 
Parliament. And it's a lot of firsts. And if you allow things to go to your head, you might let it go. But the only reason it makes sense to be the first is if others are going to come. And if others are going to come, it means our mission has now started. A few years ago, six, seven years ago, the Commonwealth did a study that showed that Barbados was the second best place in the Commonwealth for young girls to grow up. New Zealand was the best, then Barbados, then Trinidad and Tobago. And I believe it. And I believe that we have come a long way. And I believe that the work that has been done by this party, by men and women, by the Status of Women Reform Commission established by this Barbados Labour Party back in 1977, setting out the things that we could do from a legislative and a policy perspective to bring about greater equality in the country under the leadership and direction initially of Sir Henry Ford as he then was as Attorney General and under the direct leadership of Norma Ford and many other women like Dame Patricia Simmons, made a significant difference to the quality of life that we all have. The Family Law Act, whether we like it or not, has made a difference to bring in greater equality in the relationships between men and women. The patent aspects of discrimination are removed. But what we still have some work to do is with respect to the attitudinal aspects that affect aspects of how we function in this society. We're not yet there, but we've come a long, long, long way. And we have now to work on that, particularly as it relates to gender-based violence, because none of us can be happy when we see the victims across our society but you don't, and Glenn, you will forever go down in history, you don't legislate out a culture. You have to work with people and educate people. And I trust and pray that in the same way that Ermi Bourne gave nobility to the cause of working among her community, that those of us who come after her recognize that while we may be called to help shape policy and to give voice to policy, to be able to shape laws and to deal with that legislative framework, that the fundamental change happens at the level of the community and at the level of the family. And to that, therefore, I ask each of us to remember that we have a role to play to carry on the legacy of Ermi Bourne as she did so brilliantly for the rest of her life, not as MP, but as a citizen in the parish of St. Andrew. And that example to me is as telling as the fact that she was the first woman ever to enter representative politics in the House of Assembly in the Caribbean, and Rommel has reminded us, black woman at all in the Americas since Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman to enter Congress in 1968, another Barbadian, who in 2024, on the 30th of November, will be her 100th birthday, and we as proud Barbadians should work to celebrate it. To the people of St. Andrew, George, give them the assurance that having given us the example of Ermi Bourne, having had the confidence to blaze the way not just for a country but for a hemisphere, that we shall return the favor. And with that, I've already spoken to you and we've agreed that the government of Barbados should seek to negotiate with the owners of her house 
to acquire the house and to establish a museum. To establish a museum to pay tribute to the role of women in public life, not just representational politics, but as I said, leadership in public life at the level of the community, at the level of the family, and at the level of politics. And if we can do that, then I hope that the many young girls who are to come in this country will, like me, as I did when I first took the decision to enter politics, there was a Ermie Bourne, there was a Billy Miller, there was a Gert Seisman. For me, the notion of running was not an unusual step because I saw women before me who had done it before. And I trust and pray that the example of more and more women across this society playing their role at all levels will cause women, young girls, to recognize that this is as easy as ABC and as wonderful a relationship as understanding one, two, three. When I see young girls come to me now, wherever I am, I pause and take the time because somewhere among those young girls, there's a dream waiting to become a reality in the same way that Ermi inspired us all. So ladies and gentlemen, help us in this reality to help the people of St. Andrew make this a living testimony, not just for the people of St. Andrew and Barbados, but for the people of the Caribbean. For Ermi Bourne was truly a trailblazer. I want to end on one other point. And Cynthia, you are here. I don't take for granted what Cynthia Ford has done as a rural woman being elected and conquering the hills of politics in the way that she has done. And I want to use this opportunity tonight to salute Cynthia. Ermie Bourne's father was in politics. You heard Rommel talk about the fact that from an early age, she was exposed to people coming to the house and therefore was not intimidated by being around men. Billy Miller's father was a member of parliament and she too speaks of those things. Liz was Ermie Bourne's, I believe, great niece. And my father and grandfather was in public life. Cynthia Ford made the walk without the benefit of that assimilation from early. And boy, has she made the walk. She, as I've said many a time, represents the salt of the earth in this politics of ours. And if I had any doubt as to what the motto should have been last election, I only needed to look at Cynthia to know that it is fundamentally about caring. So when I heard Rommel tell the stories tonight of a woman who transcended representational politics always to care, I know that the Barbados Labour Party, even as we move on our 80th anniversary, remains true to the principles and precepts that guided this party from its very early years. I can only ask you to help us continue that legacy, to strengthen it, and to bring more on board. And George, I don't know why everybody wants to... <laughs> But I want to salute George Payne as I leave this stage tonight. And he's not going to forgive me because 
I discovered only yesterday that I'm not going to be here for his birthday. And since I'm not going to be here for his birthday, which is the big one, I insist that when the time comes, everybody in this room, please, on my behalf, on the 28th of September, for George's three score and 10, give him the warmest celebration and time out. I know of no younger 69-year-old man. <laughs> and I know this, that there are many that you may see in this room as MPs who flag before him. And very often, as recent as last night, when I am looking around, he and I are the two standing when all is said and done. So, I don't know what it is you have given him in St. Andrew, but whatever it is, if it is the fountain of life, then the rest of us would like to share in it. George, continue the great work that you are doing. And to the young ladies, Sonia Squared, and to those, the wonderful talent and band, this is truly been a wonderful evening, encouraged by the brilliance of the moonlight and caressed by the gentle breezes of St. Andrew. It could not be better. Thank you and God bless. Thank you so much, Madam Prime Minister. As I said, she's an inspiration. But at this time, I would like Mr. Payne, Honorable Mr. Payne, please join us on stage. It's a surprise. I was surprised myself. So just go along with us. Don't be surprised, sir. See what I told you? It is at this time I'm waiting on the other Sonia. Just bear with me. We're going to ask Mr. Belgrave, Simeon Belgrave, to join us on stage. As Mr. Belgrave joins us on stage, it is only fitting that we ask the Senator Dr. Rommel Springer to also join us on stage for this presentation. On behalf of the Barbados Labour Party, on behalf of the people of St. Andrew, we would like to present this Ermie Bourne Centennial Award to Mr. Simeon Belgrave because <laughs> without Without you, Mr. Belgrave, carrying the memory and keeping the flame alive, we would not be here tonight. So congratulations and thank you very much.
Mr. Belgroof, as the chairman of the Ermy Bourne Foundation, had indicated that he would like to make a presentation every year in the name of Ermy Bourne, the Ermy Bourne Award. And um, it is only coincidence that the members of the foundation thought it best that he should be the first recipient of the Ermy Bourne Award 2018. This time, if you realize, I'm lost for words. <laughs> that never happened to me yet in all my life, but I'm lost for words. Don't be, because you're a three-hour speaker. <laughs> I want to say to the Foundation and to George and to the Barbados Labour Party, thank you very much. And I want to tell you, as I told the congregation of St. Andrew 15 years ago, I'm a patient of cancer 15 years ago. And when I say that this is my last, you can take it for me as it is my last. And although some of us may be like Hezekiah, pray and get 15 more years, I think that 15 has come. But tonight I want to say to the Minister of Education, my sister, our sister, stand firm, have faith in God, do what is right. Tell it, I was very proud last week when I heard she came out. Because in my case, my children and ordinary people didn't want me to come out. But I came out and thank God I can say, thank God for Jerry Emptage. Thank God for what he has done for me. And Cynthia, we will be all praying for you. And a better note now, Madam Prime Minister, I know this is hard days for us. But please run the race and try and let us get the Army Bourne Museum in St. Andrew. I am hurt when I pass by her house and see the state of the day. We as a people in St. Andrew have a lot to thank her for. Let me get that before I depart this world. And I will feel very, very, very good to know something is here in place of Army Bourne. George, thank you. This is my last door. <laughs> Honorable Prime Minister, we will ask you to stay on stage. Minister Payne. Senator Springer and Mr. Belgrave, thank you so much. A wonderful round of applause for the presentation. At this time, we are going to ask some additional strong, educated, passionate, and powerful women of St. Andrew to come forward to make additional presentations and tokens and we are going to ask Ms. Tennille Graham to come forward and make a presentation to our Honorable Prime Minister. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Honorable George Walton Payne, the St. Andrew branch of the Barbados Labour Party, and the Army Warren Foundation, we'd like to give this token of appreciation to the Right Honorable Mia Amor Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados. We would like to thank you for taking your time out of your schedule to be here with us. Thank you.
I now call on yet another strong educated woman who we have adopted in St. Andrew, the wife of Senator Dr. Springer, a doctor in her own right, Dr. Sandra Springer, as we present to you a token of our appreciation. And this presentation is going to be made by Ms. Sharissa Rock. Good night. On behalf of the Right Honorable George Walton Payne, the St. Andrew branch of the Barbados Labour Party, and the Ermi Bourne Foundation, we would like to give you this token of our appreciation for taking your time to be with us tonight. As we continue with our program, we invite Ms. Tamisha White to join us for the vote of thanks for the evening. The Honorable Mia Amor Motley, QC MP, the Prime Minister of Barbados and Minister of Finance, Economic Affairs and Investment, the Honorable Dale Marshall, QCMP, the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Parliamentary Representative for St. Andrew, the Honorable George Payne, QCMP, and the Chairman of the Barbados Labour Party, members of the Cabinet of Barbados, members of Parliament, President of the Senate, Speaker of the House of Assembly, Deputy President of the Senate, Members of the Senate, Members of the Clergy, Representatives of the, pri sorry, the private sector, the media, specially invited guests, the Barbados Labour Party family, respected ladies and gentlemen. As we conclude tonight's proceedings, it is my esteemed honor and privilege to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of the St. Andrew branch of the Barbados Labor Party, the Thursday Club, the Ermi Born Foundation, and the planning committee for tonight's event in particular. It gives me immense pleasure in extending profound thanks to the first female Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley. We thank you sincerely for taking the time from your demanding portfolio to join us in commemorating the life and legacy of Ermi Bourne. Also, we wish to thank you for agreeing to present the closing remarks. Your words of wisdom are always an inspiration to us all. Indeed, Mia cares. We, sincere, we sincerely appreciate. We are sincerely appreciative. Thank you.